encourage you to get out your Bibles as the screen is not working for some reason. Okay, here we go. In some past lessons, I've been looking through the book of Matthew. One of the most powerful parts of the book of Matthew is that as you get towards the end, you see that in the way that he talked about how he had to go to Jerusalem and be arrested, tried, killed, but then be raised on the third day, there finally came a point where he knew, he knew that his time had come, and so he directs his path towards Jerusalem. He comes, he comes from the east, coming from Jericho, and goes up to the city Jerusalem. And there he has what we call the triumphal entry. And what he does is, you remember what he said in John 10, no one takes the, the shepherd's life from him. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in the same way Jesus, he went to Jerusalem. He was not taken or driven or forced to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem knowing exactly what was going to happen. And so when he gets there, he knows they're about to kill him. And so what does he do? He immediately begins, for a few chapters in Matthew, he begins to confront them, calling out their hypocrisy and their evil and really calling them to repent. Giving them, if you will, giving them one last chance. One of the things that he does is he goes into the temple grounds and he overthrows the money tables, cleanses the temple. But in Matthew 22, we have one of my favorite passages because of really just how profound it is that this conversation even happened. And I go to this passage quite a bit where Jesus is talking to the Sadducees, Matthew 22, starting in verse 23. But I want us to think about it from maybe a different perspective. What I'm going to do is we're going to look at this. We're going to look at the perspective of these people. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare this to another passage, to another perspective. Matthew 22, starting in verse 23. The same day, the Sadducees came to them, came to him, excuse me, who say that there is no resurrection. So that's important for us to understand. The Sadducees do not see resurrection. They don't believe we have an eternal spirit. They didn't believe in angels. There was a few things that the Sadducees, and if you, are, if you ever heard the song, the Sadducees were sad, you see, right? You remember? Because what? Because the things that they believed were pretty pathetic. For some reason, this Jewish sect, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the eternal soul. I mean, you can remember when, when Lazarus died that Jesus is talking to his sister, and he says, you'll see your brother again. And she says, oh, I know I'll see him again one day in the resurrection. The idea of the resurrection, even David, when his, when his uh, child died, the son of Bathsheba died, he knew that one day he would not be able to get his son back, but he would go to his son. He knew that one day there would be a reunion. It was not a foreign idea that there would be a resurrection, but the Sadducees, for whatever reason, had this very weird thinking that there's no eternal soul, there's no resurrection. There isn't anything after you die. You go in the ground. It's what, surprisingly, a lot of people today, if you'll ask them what happens after you die, they'll say, well, nothing. You're just dead. A lot of people think that way. And these people thought that way. And so let's see what they were concerned about. And really, they were just trying to trick Jesus. But let's see what they say. The Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, one, they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. So it's a hypothetical situation, kind of a riddle. He says, the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third down to the seventh. So you have a, a wife who the husband dies, and so she's taken care of by the next in line, the next oldest. And... He dies all the way down to the seventh. Verse 27, after them, after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, they're mockingly asking this question. It's a preposterous idea, they say. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. They were all married to her. So you tell me, oh, wise Jesus, in the resurrection, who she married to? And, of course, Jesus gives an answer that really is an answer that we could all learn from. He answered them, verse 29, you are wrong. Some translations say you err or are in error. You're wrong because you know neither the scriptures 
nor the power of God. When people do not know the Bible and they do not know who God is, then they're going to get everything else wrong. And they're going to get everything wrong. And he tells them, you don't know, have any idea what you're talking about because you don't know the Bible and you don't know who God is. Verse 34, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. And so he says, of course, look, gender, that's just a temporary thing. You have an eternal component that will live on forever. You're not going to be married to anybody. You're not going to get married to anybody in heaven. And in fact, God is not the God of the dead. He's the, he's the God of the living. He's the, he is. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Jesus says, and I am before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That really tweaked them, right? But he's saying, look, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Present tense. They're not dead. They're still alive. They're just They've just been separated from their bodies. Their bodies have died. But there is a life after this because they have an eternal component to themselves, the soul. But what was their perspective? What is the perspective of someone that thinks, well, when, you're, when you die, there isn't anything after that? What their, their question is about the technicalities of life, the things that are in this present world. Who's going to have my property? What's, what's my physical legacy going to be things like that they're concerned with physical circumstances they were concerned with physical comfort even that's when people are, are not concerned with or don't think that there's anything afterwards they're just concerned with here how comfortable they can be and maybe what they can leave to their children their legacy what people will think of them now but they, they don't think what happens one moment after death. Not really. Their question was mocking. They didn't believe that there was anything after death. And so they asked a preposterous question. They made fun of the idea that there wasn't anything after you die. And essentially, that's what people will do who don't believe that there's anything after you die. They don't believe that they actually have an eternal soul. Now, don't get me wrong here. There are the terms soul and spirit used as separate things within the Bible, but sometimes soul and spirit are used as the same thing. The non-physical, eternal component of every individual that's ever lived. We are all eternal beings. Sadducees didn't, they didn't believe that. And people that don't believe that, I heard someone say this uh, about people who don't believe in, in an eternal soul who are teachers. Imagine someone that doesn't think your child has a soul. You think that they're teaching them something worthwhile? Well, that's kind of a scary question, isn't it? Because if you don't see people for who they really are, then what are you going to tell them? What are you going to teach them? What are, what are you going to instill as them as virtues and as values and priorities? Well, all the wrong things. Your perspective is going to be totally skewed because you don't, have, you don't have any perspective of anything past the grave. In fact, you probably make fun of the idea that someone would even... Be concerned about that at all. And Jesus says, well, you don't have any idea who God is. You don't have any idea what the Bible says about any of this stuff. And that's why people come to those conclusions. Now there was another guy who, if you knew him when he was alive, you would probably not like him. And not because he was some Christian martyr and you're a bad person. No, because we, in our good nature as people who are trying to follow Christ, we would probably look at this person and think, well, that person is self-centered and doesn't care about anybody else, and they don't think about the future. And they're just all out for themselves. Go to Luke 16. You know this passage fairly well, I'm, I'm certain. Luke 16, starting in verse 19. And what we're looking at is perspectives. Think in mind the Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in an afterlife. But now let's go to Luke 16, verse 19. Luke 16, 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple. That means he was rich. And fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. This is a different Lazarus than died in John uh, 11, by the way. That's a different Lazarus. There was a, it was laid a poor man named Lazarus. And Lazarus was covered with sores. Verse 21. 
who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, which just means the realm of the dead is really what that means. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Now, this isn't about class warfare. This isn't if you have a good life, then that means you've got to be punished. No, no, no. He was saying, look, you live for yourself. Remember what Jesus says about you must deny yourself? He says, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your, your life for my sake, you'll find it. This guy was trying to save his life, the life that he really wanted. And because of that, he lost his soul. And so he tells him, he says, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here. You are in anguish. And besides all that, between us and you is a great chasm or gulf. A great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able. And none may cross from there to us. And then he said, what? This man who didn't care about anyone but himself. Verse 27, he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him, to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Why does he say that? Because Moses and the prophets were warning of this for hundreds of years. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Of course, alluding to Jesus being raised from the dead. How many people are Christians today? True disciples of Jesus today. Jesus said that it would be the narrow path, right? There are very few who find it. Even though he is raised from the dead, there are very few that believe. And he says, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. He said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, if they didn't hear those who were warning them before that they need to prepare for something after the grave, he says, if they not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone rises from the dead. You see, Jesus was raised from the dead, and most people still reject him. There isn't a lack of evidence. There, there's not, there's not a, a lack of something that you can put your teeth into. No, it's not about that. It's that, it's that for most people, they can't see beyond the grave. That's one of the reasons why they fear it so much. They can't see beyond the grave, mainly because they don't want to. And so in their minds, life after this one, it's not real to them. Heaven, it's not real. Hell, it's not real to them. And because of that, it doesn't matter if someone comes back from the dead. They, they don't care. They're going to have the mindset of this man. I want you to understand something about this guy that we can learn from. That one moment after his death, he became one of the greatest evangelists of all time. You think about this. Someone who is literally burning in hell wants to teach the gospel to his family. Let me tell you something. I have done a lot of funerals here in this building and in other places around here. People that I love and I know this may sound kind of weird, but I really enjoy doing funerals because of the hope of the resurrection and because it's an opportunity to remind those who miss and love the one who has died that they are in the, the arms of Christ that they have the hope of the resurrection, and that they will have a reunion one day. But the more and more I've studied this passage, I have begun to take liberties 
and I've changed the way that I talk or speak or do the lesson or whatever you want to say. I've changed the way that I do things. I may actually, I may have borrowed it from someone. I don't remember exactly. And some of you may have heard me say something like this before when I've been talking over the life of someone at a funeral. And that's this. Any one of you who has a loved one who has died, and I, I have people that have died in my life, and I imagine you have too. What I know from this passage is it doesn't matter if they were a Christian. It doesn't matter if they were a Satan worshiper. It doesn't matter if they didn't believe in God or the afterlife or anything. It didn't matter if they were the most selfish person in the world and hated your guts. Right now, on the other side of the grave, if they could tell you one thing, they would tell you to get your life right with God. This guy says, go warn my brothers so they won't come to this terrible place that I'm at. This was a guy who just moments earlier was just living his life just as comfortably and just as selfishly and just as all for himself as he could. He wasn't looking past the grave. But when he got past the grave, did he learn something new that we don't know right now? Not, not really. He didn't learn anything new. He experienced something that we haven't yet. To him, heaven and hell was real. And he knew it. It wasn't a joke anymore. It wasn't something to be taken lightly. And his brothers that probably he didn't care about in his life, he probably took advantage of them. You know, he was, he was probably the type of person that tried to have affairs with their wives. You know, this real despicable type of a person. One moment after his death says, you've got to warn them not to come to this place. Anyone you know that has died, if they could tell you one thing, they would warn you. They would warn you that beyond the grave is not a joke. It's real. It's real. You know, this man, this man who in his life was what we would think of as terrible, he totally puts us to shame. Because for the most part, Christians, Christians do not think of heaven and hell or life after this one. Not really as real, because if we did, we would act differently. We would treat people differently. We would say things differently. We would confront people about things. We would have the uncomfortable conversations. We would warn them. We would plead with them. But most of the times we don't, because we know that people won't like it. We know that we will lose friends. We know that our family members won't have anything to do with us. And so we just kind of go along to get along and we live a life where heaven and hell is just kind of uh, an idea rather than a reality. So why aren't we as zealous as this guy? Is it because we don't know what awaits us? Is it because we don't know what is waiting for the lost? Is it because we don't love them? You know, we let fear of so many things, of offending people or rubbing people the wrong way, we let that trap us into a perspective or of a thinking that makes us think that what happens after death is not absolutely the most important thing that we can talk about with someone. We're convinced of that somehow, or otherwise we would talk to people about that more and more and more. And you would have a reputation among your friends and your family and your coworkers. And the lady you see all the time at HEB, and you'd have a reputation among them. Maybe as the crazy person, or maybe as the person that cares about them, or the person who really believes. You'd have some kind of a reputation, but do, do I? 
Do we have that kind of a reputation among our friends and family? That they know that for us, for me, it's real. It's real. In 2 Corinthians 5, the first part of verse 11, Paul says, Therefore, knowing the fear or the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Because of what we know to be true, he says, we persuade people. We warn people. We show them why Jesus is worthy to be followed. You go down a few verses. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. He says, when you look at anybody, you you can't see what they look like. You can't see how old they are. You can't see what kind of clothes they have. You can't see what kind of car they drive. You can't see what kind of job they have or what kind of grades they have. The color of their hair, the color of their skin. Anything about them that's physical. He says, you don't think of anyone at all ever again according to the flesh. From now on, you see them the way that God sees them. As someone who has an eternal destiny, either with God or not with God. And knowing the fear or terror of the Lord, we persuade them. Because we know the truth and we see them for who they really are. C.S. Lewis said this. C.S. Lewis said this. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilization, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke, who we work with who we marry, who we snub, who we exploit. They are immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. He says they have an eternity before them, and it will either be heaven, literally, or a nightmare. And we cannot see any individual as having any other future but one or the other of those two choices there are some places in the the new testament that really spell out the power that we have or what really is on the line in jude which is only one chapter when you start in verse 20 look at what jude says but you beloved building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the holy spirit Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Do we ever think about people in that way? That that when we reach out to them with a, a conversation about their future or about their soul, that, that we, are, we are extending a hand to snatch them out of the fire. Do we really think of it that way? Because that is exactly what it is. The very last two verses of the book of James, James 5, 19 and 20, are so powerful. James 5, 19 and 20, James says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering or from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Do we understand our power that when we extend our hand to someone that we are seeking to undo in their life what sin has done in their life in separating them from God? In 1 Peter 4, verses 7 and 8, 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8, Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins we we must love people and the life after this one must be real to us or we're not going to do any of this it's either one of the two or both that 
we either don't believe it or we just don't really care about people. And I think the more that we believe it, the more that it will light a fire under us and see, I have a duty out of love for someone. You know, to go back to 2 Corinthians 5, do you know what, what Paul says is our motive? He says, it's the love of Christ compels you. When you love someone, it will cause you to do things that you wouldn't do if you didn't love somebody. The Bible, it needs to be real to us. Heaven and hell, they got to be real to us. When we see people, we must see their souls. And it means seeing eternity. Every person that you run into, every person that you meet, you must look at them and see them as having an eternity before them. And you must think that way all the time. You know, James said that every life is a vapor, James 4, 14. And we have to look at people that way. We have to look at ourselves that way. That every day could be that person's last, every day could be my last. But typically we don't wake up thinking that way. I heard someone say recently that you know, no one wakes up thinking they're going to die that day. Maybe occasionally some people have an idea, but most people don't wake up thinking they're going to die. It just happens. You know, whenever I travel, as I did some traveling the last couple of weeks, one of the things that, I don't know what it is, the older I get, the more I study, the, the more I'm thinking about eternity, the more and more I just think this could be the last time I see these people. This could be the last time I get in this car. We have to think that way, but not only about ourselves. And it's not about being morbid. It's about being honest that this life isn't all that there is, and it's a vapor, and it's not guaranteed. Likewise, we have to think that about everyone else. That their life is going to be cut short, shorter than they thought it would be. What would change about our words, about our behavior? about our motives, about our decision-making, about our priorities, about our conversations, about our associations. If we woke up every day thinking that way, today could be my last day, today could be their last. Would we be the crazy person that warns them? Because, see, the world's already going to think we're crazy. The problem is, is that a lot of Christians think that it's crazy. To warn people. I'm here to tell you this morning that it is not crazy. It's not crazy to think every time you see someone, I, I need to make sure this person goes ahead with me. I, I don't want this person to be lost. I don't care about who they are in the sense of their status or what they can do for me or what they what I think they offer the church. Or that they might even say, no, get out of my face. I have to love them enough that I will be crazy, as a lot of people see. This is a lesson that's been developing over time. I wrote an article that, um, I wrote an article back in 2013 based on a lesson that I heard from a man some of you know, Neil Pollard. One of the guys that's been in our prayer list for a while, Brent Pollard, that I went to, to college with, uh, is his younger brother. Neil Pollard is a prolific preacher in the Brotherhood. And when he was the preacher at the uh, Bear Valley Church of Christ in Denver, he talked about in this lesson that the elders there, they decided that their emphasis, not, not like a program or something, but that the emphasis of their congregation was going to be two words. Think souls. Think souls. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, whoever you see, wherever your life takes you, see people the way that God sees people. He talked about having a a really concentrated effort to follow up with people. And that's something that 
that's a ministry that, that we now are, are doing and is building some steam. You know, just the idea of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 of going and teaching someone how to be a disciple, baptizing them, and then continuing to teach them more and more and more and a follow-up with them and a continuing to grow them. We do that when we understand that someone has a soul. You know, when we think about just the idea of you know, going door knocking this week or those of us who would just think to be evangelistic in our lives or to talk to someone about their eternity. <clears throat> Neil Pollard mentioned that he knew, he knew the secret to getting a Bible study with someone. Now, I think maybe I've shared the secret with you before. Do you know what the secret is to getting someone to study the Bible with you. You want to write this down because this is, this, is, this is magical, all right? This is what you ask them. <clears throat> Will you study the Bible with me? Now, you may think, well, no, hold on, that, but that, I, I could have figured that one out. Yeah, but we don't ask it, do we? we? We typically don't think to even go towards that topic at all. Because we're afraid they're going to label us as what? As what? What are we afraid of? We know more than they know. We know what eternity has. When they don't think of the future and they even make fun of it, our response rightly when we are studying, when we're being faithful, is the words of Jesus. Look, you don't know who God is, and you don't know what the Bible says about your eternity. That's what he told them in Matthew 22. Now, it's not that we would be condescending to them. It's just that we need to know that we know what they don't know. And they can think that we're crazy, and that's okay. We're going to love them anyway. Because if we're okay with being the crazy person, then eventually we're going to have people in our lives, one after the other after the other, who after they think, something ridiculous about us after a while they're going to come to themselves and they're going to understand who God is and what the Bible teaches and they're going to say thank you for being uncomfortable with me and asking uncomfortable questions thank you for coming across as a crazy person for me because I know now it's because that you love me and because you knew something that I didn't know thank you for not seeing this Thank you for seeing the part of me that will live on forever. Now the odds are that most people in your life are not going to say that. But if we would just start, then we will find that there will be people in our lives who will actually say yes. And they will appreciate us. And they will love us in return for the love that we had for them in spite of the fear of coming to them. You know, when the church was being torn apart, at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen was stoned and Paul was holding the coats of those and he consented to the death. And then at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, there was a widespread persecution of the church. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Luke records this, now those who were scattered went about hiding in caves and people's houses. No, it doesn't say that. You know what it says? Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. There's something special about the Christian life. That when we're really trying to be faithful, difficulty brings everything into perspective, even more than it was before. It gives us clarity for our purpose because when the rug is pulled out from under us and we don't have the hope in the things that we've been planning for, that we thought life was all about, then we realize, you know what? I know what life is really about. It's about what's after this life. And we have clarity. And when the church was, you might say, punched in the face by persecution, these people, they were scattered everywhere, and what did they do? They go and hide, and they went out and started preaching. In the next section, there's about Philip going into Samaria, and about Simon the sorcerer being converted, and about Peter and John coming up and confronting him, if you remember that. 
But see, a lot of times we don't start because we know that people's lives are messy. Conversion for an individual is difficult. It's an uncomfortable thing for anyone to go through. It's a transformation of life. It's a denial of self. It's giving up of so many things. When, when you're being used as the instrument of God to help change someone's life and give their life over to Christ, what we find is, is that we are now intimately involved in someone's broken and messed up life. And you know what? A lot of times we see that long distance and we think, I'm not going to get into that. And instead of seeing their life circumstance, we need to see what God sees. We need to see their soul. We need to see if they have an eternal destiny, one or the other. And I have been charged to help them have clarity enough to make a decision rather than to go into eternity in ignorance. You know, when we think about evangelism, we go, what did I say? We're going to go door knocking for how long? For how long do we usually go when it's really hot? And it's really hot most of the time here, right? We go for about an hour. Some people don't last that long. And you know what? We still meet a few people. But you know what? Door, door knocking is not really that effective. That's why we don't do it quite that much. It's not the only thing that we can do. In our everyday lives, everywhere that we go, we see people all the time. And through relationships and friendships, that's where we're going to do the bulk of our evangelism. But there are simply there are people that are close by in neighborhoods that we're just not going to meet unless we just knock on their door. And so taking about an hour, hour and a half, once a month, well, that's, that's not a big deal. That's, that's not real hard. And it's not the only way. But the reason that we can do it just little by little is because we don't think short term about things. A farmer doesn't plant a seed and walk out tomorrow and say, well, I'm giving up on farming because it didn't sprout. No, that would be ludicrous to think. But when we shine the light and plant seeds and we just look at it long term, the long haul, thinking souls has to be a long term thing. We work with people. People are messy. We work with them and encourage them over time. We ask them questions. We engage them to think about the future, to think about their souls little by little over time. We meet uh, three or four people on a, one Saturday a month and we let them know that we care about them and that we want to talk to them about their future, about eternity. And then the next month, maybe we meet a few more people. And little by little, it all adds up. Because the Christian life is not about a matter of, well, I got baptized, and I guess, yeah, I'm good. Or evangelism is not, and I've seen some places do this, where they have uh, 150 people, they come, and they go out into the, and they knock all the doors in the community, and then that's all they do for 20 years. It just has to be a slow and a steady and a long-term way of doing things. It has to be the culture of our congregation. You see, warning people about eternity, that just has to be ingrained in our lifestyle. The more of us who act and live that way, the more and more other people who are immediately around us will be emboldened to do that, to be the crazy person, to have the uncomfortable conversations, to say the things that they normally would be too afraid to say. Sometimes it's people who are brand new Christians. Sometimes it's just younger Christians who we might think, well, they don't know any better. They don't know how they're coming across. And yet they encourage me and embolden me. And so we need to do it together. You know, one of the things uh, uh, that Neil Pollard did was is he gave sort of a list of things. When we're engaging with people, we're engaging with souls. He said, you know, when you're talking to someone, make it no strings attached. You're just coming to them to bless their life. He says, go to them to build, just build a relationship with them. 
Usually the gospel is given from one person to another, not exclusively, not always, but it happens the easiest in a mutual caring relationship within that context. When you're talking to someone, do they know that you believe that there's a life after this one? When you're talking to them, do they know that you, to you heaven is real and to you hell is real? And in that way, do you speak to them expecting them to respond positively and to say, yeah, you know what? You know something I don't. You act a way that I, I, don't, I don't understand. I want to know what... I want to know what's wrong with this person. <laughs> a lot of times that's what they'll think. If we really act like we believe that they have an eternal soul. And so, Neil says, when we frame things, expect the person to say yes. Be specific with them. You know, normally, traditionally, we all, you know, we offer an invitation. And it's kind of become cliché. And I hate that it's become cliche. We offer an invitation, but we invite people to respond to the gospel, to turn their life over to God or turn their life back to God. We do an invitation traditionally. And let me tell you something. Every time, every time, I expect people to respond to the invitation because I believe Jesus is worthy to respond to. And I believe that if your life is not right with him, then Jesus is worthy for you to respond to his invite. I believe that. And when we talk to people, we need to believe that. When we talk to people, we don't need to beat around the bush for years and months and for days. Get to the heart of the matter. Talk to them about Jesus. Paul said, I came to preach Christ and him crucified. Let people have that as your reputation. Oh, that's the guy that talks about Jesus. When we talk to people, ask them. Ask them questions, not that are hard, but that are difficult in the sense that you're asking them to think about things that normally they have wanted to be blissfully ignorant to thinking about. And Paul tells the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, he says, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. As we continue to do this, we cannot lose heart. We will want to give up. But he says, don't grow weary in doing good. You know, Jesus was motivated by seeing souls. When Jesus recruited the apostles, what did he see? Did he see fishermen? Did he see tax collectors? What did he see? He saw souls. Why did he ask them or tell them, you're going to be fishers of men? Because there were souls that needed to be saved or caught. You know, we saw Zacchaeus in the tree. Did he see a selfish, rich, short guy? He saw a soul that needed to be saved. When Jesus in, encountered the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, did he see this, what they would think of as a half-breed woman that he needs to keep his distance from? No, he saw a soul that needed him. She needed salvation. When Jesus told Nicodemus that you got to be born again, was he talking about our physical body? No, he's talking about a spiritual rebirth. You know, the soul is the only truly important characteristic of any individual. Not their social status or their skin color or their language they speak or their background or anything like that. You know, Paul wrote to Philemon about a slave, Onesimus, and he says, I don't want you to see him as a slave. I want you to see him as your brother, as a soul. When Jesus was tried illegally and was brought before the Sanhedrin and before Herod and before Pilate and before the Roman guards and those who scourged him and tortured him and mocked him, those who crucified him. What did he see? He just saw souls. Uh, that's why in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him was the salvation of the souls of those who were killing him. We need to see people the way that Jesus sees people. God loves us and sent his son because he sees us as souls. He gave us our souls. When we're, go, when we're told to go and teach the gospel, Jesus is saying we need to have a life that is soul-focused. Why did Paul travel and teach and write and revisit people? Because he knew their souls were on the line. You know, when Paul was beaten, and he makes this list where he's beaten, where he's stoned, where he's shipwrecked, where he's in peril in various ways, he's weary and tired, he's sleepless, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he was cold, he was naked. He says in 2 Corinthians 11 that his deep concern was for them, was for their souls. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, Paul said, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Do we have that kind of a dedication? That we, for the souls of others, would spend and be spent. That we would just pour ourselves out because we understand and see them the way that Jesus sees them. We need to see right now what will be seen by everyone. When God pushes back the physical world like a curtain and exposes the things that are eternal. We know enough now to see all of that already. When the world is totally blind to it. When this world when this world is gone. Me my family My friends, that obnoxious person at the football game, my cashier at Walmart, the person I was walking down the hall and passed and tried not to make eye contact with, every person that I've ever seen, brushed shoulders with, everyone, that I could have had some influence on will be in eternity. Dare we see them the way that God sees them and change their life? What are we so scared of? Either we don't believe it or we don't love them. And if that's the case, then why are we even here? What are we doing? Who are we? We need to see others the way that God sees us. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 19, Luke records this. Uh, this This is about a man who was rich. He had everything he wanted. And Luke records this, that Jesus is saying, he says, I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. You know what? That seems to be the the American goal, right? To just be able to pile up enough that you can just kind of sit back and relax. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool! This night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? (laughs) Everything you've piled up for yourself, someone's going to get it. And as Solomon said, they're not going to care for it the way that you did. And Jesus says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Do you see yourself the way that God sees you as a soul? Who has sinned? That separates you from God for eternity. Do you understand that Jesus came to shed his blood as a sacrifice that can wash away your sins? So that the eternal part of you, when this body is gone, 
that it will live on forever with Christ. Because you did what he said, uniting yourself with his death and with his resurrection when you're born again, born again, being baptized into Christ. Have you done that? Do you think that way? And do you see people the way that God sees them? There's only two places after all is said and done. And everyone that you've ever met will either be one of those two places. Either they will be with you and with God, or they will not. Or they will be with God, and you will not. If we don't see reality, we are souls. We are not people. We're souls. We have an eternity. And what will you do with it? It's your choice. God gives us that choice. You have the choice to influence other people in a way that is more profound than they will ever be able to realize. But they will thank you forever if you try to change their life. BJ has a song of encouragement, a time of invitation. Jesus is worthy to be served. He's worthy to give your life for. If you need to do that, come as we stand and sing.